And increasingly, people are recognizing that, that if you look at a, a plaque area in an artery, which is, is actually, the artery remains circular, by the way. If you look at it, basically, the, the, what you see is if you, do, if you do angiograms on arteries yearly on people who've got known heart disease, what you don't see is that it gradually thickens and does that. What happens is you'll look and it'll suddenly be that size. And then it'll suddenly be that size. It's called phasic growth, right? Mm. It doesn't gradually increase as, as LDL gets into your blood vessel one molecule at a time. What's happening is you're getting a, a clot. The clot is repaired, but that leaves you with a larger plaque. Now that is, you know, I could find you a million studies showing that that is accepted, that that's what's going on. So when you've got heart disease, you've got, you've got the final event is a blood clot. The, the growth of a plaque is a blood clot. But what the mainstream won't accept is that that is also what starts it in the first place because it's LDL that starts it off by going into your blood vessels, which we've just discussed is an impossible uh, process. And then blood clotting takes over. So well, no, all, all that this hypothesis suggests is, is blood clotting from start to finish. It's the same process. It's the same process all the way through. It's just you damage the endothelium, the blood clot forms, it's repaired, it's gone. If you accelerate the damaging process, you've got a problem. I, I sometimes liken it to, to, um, to, to potholes on a road, whereby you know, roads, if you don't do any repair on them, you actually end up with enormous potholes. So the council has to come along and cover them over and repair them. Mm. So long as they're doing that fast enough, you don't have a pot pothole problem. If they're not doing that fast enough, you have a major pothole problem. So it really is just a balancing act here between this is going on all the time. So what you've got to try to do is, is reduce the amount of things that you do that can be damaging to the endothelium, because that will reduce the damage part of it. You've got to reduce things that make the blood clots that form bigger and more difficult to get be got rid of. And you've got to enhance the repair systems in your body as much as you can. Now, obviously, the thing that damages your repair processes more than anything is getting old, unfortunately, which is why age is such a major risk factor. Because when you're younger, your repair systems are probably going, ha-ha, 20 cigarettes a day, no problem. Everywhere the cholesterol hypothesis, when you look at logic, data, and actual science of what's happening, uh, it fails, right? All your lipidology associational nonsense passes because it's peripheral. It's meaningless. It's built on sand. But the core stuff, this one then fits, I think, with every genuine fact or, or, or reality around the science, the biology. Uh, there may be exceptions. I don't think there are. We'll get to those. But let's look through the ones it does fit with. If you take genetic susceptibility and hotspots of atherosclerosis, where there's uh, junctions in the arterial tree, and you know that fits perfectly right with this uh, process you know if you've got high blood pressure if you, you have as you say areas of bifurcation in the arteries where there's more turbulent flow there's more stress on the endothelium these tend to be the points where 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 the plaques develop I and mean, why do the plaques develop most in the heart for example well as someone said you know the heart is a unique because because the blood flows through most blood vessels when the heart contracts but when the heart contracts, the blood stops flowing through the coronary arteries because the pressure on the arteries is so great, it blocks the flow. It's only when it relaxes that the blood can flow. So someone described a coronary artery as it's like someone stamping on a, on a garden hose 60 times a day. There's an enormous amount of biomechanical stress on coronary arteries. So, so that fits with that, the blood, the blood pressure is, is a thing. I mean, when you look at smoking, yes, well, clearly smoking, we can see that it damages the lining of the blood vessels. When you look at air pollution, if you look at small particle air pollution, these nanoparticles get into your bloodstream. So that also fits. And then when you look at, um, at raised blood sugar level, now this is fascinating because, uh, you know, you ask 100 doctors, have you ever heard of the glycocalyx? And they'll look at you blankly. Well, the glycocalyx is the lining all endothelial cells have, and it's a bit like, you know, if you try to pick up a fish, not all fish, they slip through your fingers because they're covered in glycocalyx, which is really slippery, slippery stuff, better than Teflon. And it consists of, the, the glycocalyx comes from the fact it's made of glucose, 
protein structures that are a bit like tendrils or, or grass or whatever that stick out of your endothelial cells and form this kind of lining, protective lining around all of your endothelial cells. And it's hugely important for protecting them within the glycocalyx, lurks, anticoagulation factors, things that stop your blood clotting, just really potent things that make sure that, that, that nothing hits the endothelial cell and damages it. And it also stops things sticking to endothelial cells. So, so your glycocalyx is hugely important for protection of your endothelium. And you can actually measure this. I mean, there is a mechanism, there's a thing called a glycometer, which you can stick under your tongue and it looks at your blood vessels under your tongue. And you can look at the you can look at the, the endothelial the, the capillaries under your tongue, and you can see how thick the, the glycocalyx is. And thicker glycocalyx is good, thinner glycocalyx is bad. When people actually have sepsis, you can measure the difference in thickness of the glycocalyx with regard to how serious the sepsis is. Quite a good measure of how likely you are to live or die. If you have sepsis, it's your glycocalyx thickness. Oh, by the way, the reason why sepsis kills you is that is that bacteria get into your bloodstream, they multiply the waste products of bacteria called exotoxins, and these exotoxins travel around your circulatory system, wiping out endothelial cells, mm -hmm. destroying the glycocalyx, and then you get blood clots all the way through your body. And you get a thing called disseminated intravascular coagulation, disseminated widespread intravascular within your blood vessels, coagulation, blood clots. That's why, you know, you get people who get menin meningitis, sepsis, they end up losing the tip of their noses or fingers or arms because of the blood supply is being shut off. And the thing that kills them is the organ damage normally. So, mm -hmm. so exactly the same thing that kills you with sepsis is what kills you with smoking, is what kills you with you raise blood pressure, the mechanism may seem a million miles away, or the, the, the factor may seem hugely far apart. The process is always the same. You're damaging the glycocalyx or you're damaging the endothelial cells or both. And when you have diabetes, your blood sugar level is, goes shooting up and a raised blood sugar level has been shown to thin and damage the glycocalyx of all cells in your body, all endothelial cells in your body. And this becomes particularly important when you look at uh, at some of the, the smaller vessel damage you get is particularly important in diabetes. Because as you know, with diabetes, you get eye problems and kidney problems and nerve cell problems because the circulation and the blood supply to these very small areas, if you like, these very small cells is damaged. 